Good evening and welcome. <laughs> I am Nigella Hilgarth, the Executive Director of the Budge Aquarium at Scripps, and it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Richard Seymour, to the latest Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science. <laughs> And before he starts speaking, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Seymour. He earned his degree in engineering and then his PhD here at Scripps in 1974 in oceanography. And he is a, uh, an oceanographic engineer. He's in fact one of the, uh, probably the most uh, prestigious in the world in ocean engineering. And he is the head of the Ocean Airing Research Group at Scripps and he's the principal investigator here on a wave measurement project that he started in 1976. And he has also been director of so many things that it would take me all evening to talk about it, but one of them was the uh, Technology Research Center, and the mission of that center was looking at the advanced engineering needing in developing floating platforms in very, very deep water, about six to 10,000 feet. He served on numerous committees and boards, and he was a member of the team that evaluated the state of the art in ocean thermal energy conversion under the auspices of the Marine Board of the National Research Council. He's published over 150 books, journal articles, and reports on ocean engineering. And he's also um, been asked to consult extensively with many um, startup companies, particularly in the area of the wave energy field, which of course is so topical today. So we are extraordinarily lucky to have such a world expert talk to us this evening. Richard, please, thank you. Good evening. I thought it might be well if we spent just a very few minutes right at the beginning uh, to have a refresher course in waves uh, and if the surfers and the oceanographers will just sit on their hands for a few minutes, we'll be through this. And, and uh, the rest of you, I hope, uh, will be somewhat refreshed in your knowledge of where waves come from. So it all starts with the sun. The sun warms the atmosphere near the surface. The air rises. The creating winds by the air rushing in to, to fill this partial vacuum. And that air wants to go directly to the center of the low pressure form, that's low pressure area that's formed. But at least in the northern hemisphere, it's forced to turn to the right. And this is one of the unexpected results of the rotation of the Earth, and we're not going to go into that in this course. <laughs> so let, let us just say that the winds in the Northern Hemisphere move around the low pressure area in a counterclockwise way. Now the lows tend <coughs> to creep rather slowly towards the east, typically, which means that the winds on the southern end of the low here are approaching essentially undisturbed ocean. So let's look at one of these wind fields around the outside that might be pointing at La Jolla. Now this is a, a very complicated chart, but it's important in our real understanding of how waves get there. So this wind field that we just looked at is coming in here from the left. And the first thing that it does is kick up ripples, little tiny wavelets, and then pushes on them until they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bigger the wave gets, the faster it travels. And so you have simultaneously have large waves moving quickly through this field and little ripples moving slowly and everything in between. Now, this, the other thing that I want you to, to 
clearly understand is that although the wind is blowing in this direction, waves are being generated in multiple directions, really in every direction. But very strong waves are being spun off on either side of this center path of the wind. And, and that's quite important to, to developing what we call a fully developed sea. We get to that point when the fastest waves are now moving as fast as the wind. Well, in some sense, the wind can't push on them anymore, so they can't get any bigger. And so we're going to stop at that point in the, in the process right now, where the line is, and, and take a look at what a fully developed sea looks like. Big waves, little waves, waves moving in almost every direction, a very, very confused state. If you look down on it from the top, it looks even worse. But there are components of waves in there that are headed for Oregon. There's some more that are headed for Baja, California. But there also, in the center of all this, are those waves which are heading towards La Jolla. Now, what happens to, to these waves as they move out of the generating area is that the fast waves, the big waves, the fast waves move out way ahead of the slow ones. So there's a sorting process that goes on. So waves are getting further and further apart as, as the separation occurs. The, the height of the sea is decreasing because the same amount of energy is now being spread over a much larger area. And since the other directions have now gone off towards Oregon or Baja, we now see the waves in a particular place moving more or less in the same direction. And that situation we call swell. That is the, the result of the wind stop pushing on it and allowing these waves to coast on into the nearest shore. And by the time those waves get to our beach, this is what they look like. But let's go back to the fully developed sea, because that's where the energy is, and that's what we're really interested in in this, in this talk tonight. As Nigella said, we started measuring waves in my lab in 1976, and we've acquired millions upon millions upon millions of records of wave height from all over this coast and other places in the world. This is a little snip a little 10 minute snip out of one of those records during a storm. And you can see there's places where the waves are quite low, other places where they're high. The length of the waves varies depending upon how fast they're moving and what their period is. But let's look at the biggest wave that occurred in 10 minutes. What are its characteristics? First off, its height is over 40 feet. It's pretty imposing. <coughs> the period or the time between arrival of crests is 14 seconds, and that means with 14 second period in deep water, uh, the length crest to crest for this wave would be about 1,000 feet. And for those of you who have trouble visualizing that, that's just a little bit shorter than Scripps Pier. Now, there are are many kinds of waves. We've been talking about wind waves, waves that are generated by the wind. There are many kinds of waves in the ocean, and we're not going to talk about them all, but I, I want to talk about a couple. Uh, I imagine there are, are many of you here who would be surprised to know that the tide does not go in and out. The tide is, in fact, along this shore, a very fast-moving wave. Its length is thousands of miles. It travels at hundreds of miles per hour. And when a crest passes La Jolla, we see a high roughly every 12 hours. And roughly six hours later, the trough of that wave passes La Jolla, and we call that a low. Most of you, I think, are 
at least vaguely familiar with tsunamis. Now, I couldn't put all the crests of a, of a tsunami wave in here, but if there were a, up here someplace in the Aleutians, an underwater earthquake or a landslide, it's possible to generate this series of very long waves. Now, they're short in length, only, only dozens of miles compared to the tide, but they're very, very long waves compared to wind waves. And also, they move very fast. And so, these tsunami waves would sweep down our coast. And in certain places, because of the geometry of the bottom, they would be reinforced. They're not very high waves, but they would be reinforced enough to cause flooding and, and damage, but, but only in local conditions. Great. <laughs> you, all, you all passed. All right. Now, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about my research because I'm interested in it. Uh, and what I study right now is, is very big waves, big storm waves along the whole Pacific coast. And I'm, I, I'm interested in how the number and the size of these, of these storm waves changes over long periods, say 10-year say periods. And I'd very much like to know what causes the difference between one 10-year period and another 10-year period. So how do, you, how do I find these big waves? How do I know when I have a big wave? Well, a program a computer to do more or less what I'm going to show you, which is to, to look at all these millions and millions of records, look at every point in those records, which is every few every less than a second, actually, between, between points, and, and measure the height of those waves. And then during an hour, I'll, I'll pick the one-third largest waves. And then I'll take the average of those waves, and that statistic is called significant wave height. And it's very important to, to oceanographers and to wave mechanics. Uh, and it actually tells you a great deal about what's going on in that particular field. So I tell the computer, if that significant wave height is more than 20 feet, hang on to it. You may have a live one here. So keep going. And if, you, if it stays above 20 feet for 24 hours, for a whole day, that's a big wave event. OK. Now, that's, that's an average of the one-third highest. What's, what's the highest wave? Do we have any idea what the highest wave would be during that period? Well, let's just take the, the storm that just makes it, just makes it into my pool. And it's, it's just right at, at 20 feet. And so it's the smallest one that I'm going to, to deal with in my research. And I know that every four hours, I'm going to have at least one wave which is as tall as a four-story building. My studies cover the whole of the West Coast and are divided into regions more or less by state boundaries, except that in California, right here at Point Conception, there is a tremendous change in the storminess between Northern California and Southern California. So I, I treat Southern California as a separate region within my study. I started with data from 1984. I didn't go all the way back to 1976 because this is the first year that really had sufficient information from the whole coast to do this kind of study and continued the, the study until this spring, spring of 2008, which is the end of the winter of 2007. And all these storms happen in the winter, and so you, that is really the, the time of year that you're looking for them and will find them. So this is a total of 24 years. I can divide this now into two even 12-year periods and look at the difference between them. Now, this is where the measurements were actually taken. The, the red triangles are wave measuring buoys that are installed and maintained uh, by NOAA. And the yellow circles are the ones that belong to my lab. In this, in this study, we have 
hourly observations, more than two million of them, uh, in order to establish the, the database. And that means that we have more than 150 million discrete height measurements to look at, to look through, to find, to go through that routine to find out when were the big storms. This is one of our wave buoys. It's a, it's a surface follower and it, it detects up and down motion and also back and forth motion. So in addition to wave height with this, with this buoy, we can also determine the characteristics of, of the direction of the waves. Okay, these are the large events that I found in this 24 year period. And you see it's divided into the, into the two columns. Well, one of the things that you see is that Washington and Oregon have averaged about three of these storms per year during the second period, but only one per year in the first period. And uh, Northern California had five times as many in the second period as in the first period. And Southern California looks like it's on another planet. Okay. But, but taking the whole thing together, there were about three times as many of these huge storm events in, in the second period than there were in the first. Well, that's, that's a big change. Why, why are they so different? And, and that really is a, the body of, of my ongoing research. What are the reasons? Well, one of the things we know is that the North Pacific changes its temperature slightly from cool to less cool uh, about every 10 years. And that might have some impact on, on how stormy it would be. Uh, there's a, an index of that called PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and, and that index is available for every month and, every, and of course every year. Uh, most of you are familiar with the concept of El Ninos. You live in this part of the world. And there's another index called the ENSO in index, which tells us, are we in a El Nino? Are we in a La Nina? Are we nowhere in between someplace? And, and so that's a valuable index as well. But there's a combined index, which takes in both of the two above, and it, its nickname is MEI. And it's combined with consideration of a lot of other physical properties of the, of the ocean, which might or might not really have some influence on the storminess. But the MEI is calibrated such that you can look at the number and you can say, ah, that was a big, that was a large El Nino, or that was a large La Nina, or a moderate one in between. So that allows me to make a graph like this. And on it, I can show by color bars when in time you see the, the years across the horizontal axis, the division between the two uh, periods in the middle. And I've also added at the bottom an, an additional feature in the, in the darker blue, which is the average annual temperature of, of the Pacific Ocean. And the horizontal dashed lines are the average over the whole 12 years. So you can see from this that it was warmer in the first period than it was in the second period. After you look at this for a very long time, you can also see that there were a lot more El Ninos in the first period and a lot more La Ninas in the second period. Now, based on what we thought we knew going into this study, that should say that the first period should be very stormy and the second period shouldn't be very stormy at all. First, first period with lots of El Ninos, warm water, oh, stormy, stormy. Well, of course, as you've seen, it's a complete reverse of that, many, many times stormier in the, in the second period. Now, I've, I've put on here all those large events that I found. The ones that are in red here are the ones that happen to have a, a single wave in there which was larger than 10 meters or 33 feet. So they're the, the real jumbo ones. Notice they're all in the second period, as well as the predominance of all the black dots are in the, in the second period. So I'd like to, to point out one of those storms. 
Uh, not the biggest by any means, but it does occur at a relative warm spot for the, for the second period, and it does occur in, within a moderate uh, El Nino. And here's the NOAA weather map for that particular storm. This is the 16th of December in 2002, and there is a mammoth, mammoth low which stretches all the way from Siberia almost to Hudson Bay. And if you look at this color in the middle, and then look down at this chart, that is the lowest atmospheric pressure that NOAA ever puts on their maps. So this is a very, very huge feature. Now, I've added that, that white arrow to indicate the general direction of, of the wind field surrounding the core of the low, and you see it's pointing right at the northwest. And that arrow is 2,000 miles long. So there's 2,000 miles of ocean that, that a very strong wind can, can act on building waves, and it built them. And so we had this very unusual situation in one day. We had waves higher than 30 feet from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, and even, even Southern California. And this was the only event of that size within this 24-year period. And now, tantalizingly, without any answers, I'm going to switch to a new question. OK. <laughs> we're going to talk about getting green energy out of the ocean. And specifically, we're going to talk about using waves uh, to produce electricity. Now, one of the things I've noticed, uh, and some of you here will know who I'm talking about, uh, as soon as you start talking about waves, it brings out the inventor in you. You, you, you. you start waving your arms, moving your hands, and talking about devices that, that could get energy out of, out of waves. And, and why is that? Well, I think one of the reasons is that, that waves are a tremendous concentrator of, of solar energy. So if we just look at the, at the energy density around the, around the globe, uh, the sun weighs in at about an average over the year of about 100 watts. Uh, wind can kick that up by a factor of 10 without any great difficulty. Waves in certain places in the ocean can be 200 or even close to 400 times the energy density of the sun. So it's a tremendous mechanism for taking the sun's energy and focusing it all in one place at one time. Uh, and that's what makes it attractive as a, as a source. So how much power is that, say, in an individual wave? Well, if it's, it's flat, calm, it's zero. And around Antarctica, where the biggest waves in the world exist, it's a huge 80 megawatts for every mile of crest width. Now, I converted that to 100 watt light bulbs per foot of crest, because that's a little easier for me to grasp, and probably is for you, too. But I want you to understand that even if you had a machine which was strong enough to withstand that huge wave, you could only extract a little bit of that energy as it came by. So you don't get it all. You don't even get the majority of it. You can get a little bit of it. But let's do a thought exercise here. Let's, let's just imagine that somehow we're going to capture all the wave energy from around all of our coast for a whole year. And so we take it on the low days and the high days and average it all together. Now, that's, that's a ridiculous idea. I mean, you, you couldn't do that, no matter what. But to understand the size of the resource, that total amount of energy, if we could get it all, is about what we get now from hydroelectric dams. So there's a very important point here. Although the, the wave resource is huge, and it's this great concentrator, Nevertheless, it is not going to be the answer to energy independence for the United States. So it, will, it is green energy, it's important, but it doesn't solve all our problems by any means. And so we need to, to keep that in, in perspective. It's not a new idea. It's been around since gasoline was 15 cents a gallon. And I learned to read about a year after this. 
Uh, this chart shows the distribution of this resource. And if you look at, at, look at these numbers, yeah, they're nice and clear. Uh, you look at these numbers, you see that it's not very high in the tropics, and it, and it grades the higher numbers as you move north and south into the temperate zones. It's higher on the western side of, of all of the continents than on the eastern side in general because of the prevailing winds. But there is an exception. And look at that number right there next to the British Isles. And I think that that goes a long way to ex towards explaining why it's Irish engineers and British engineers who are responsible for the great bulk of the engineering development of wave power devices. We're going to talk this evening about four types. There are four generic types of, of devices. We're going to look at examples of each of these. And of these four that we're going to look at, three of them are producing electricity in Europe today and have been for some time. The fourth one is proposed for the United States and will probably be our first uh, application and it will be in California. So the first one is called an oscillating water column. Any of you have ever uh, seen a blowhole in Hawaii or there's, there's one in Baja, California, not far south of here, uh, a place where there's a cave and, and waves run into it and, and air is squeezed out of the top and it usually throws some, some water out in the process. And this is a man-made blowhole. And so it's, it's stoutly built into, the, into usually a, a rock uh, shoreline. And so as the, the waves enter into this chamber and run up this artificial beach, it squeezes the air out through this hole and through a turbine, and the turbine is connected to a generator and we get some electricity out of this. When the, when the wave recedes back down that slope, it, it now sucks air back through the same hole, and the turbine is very cleverly designed to not care which way the, the air is going. It turns in the same direction all the time. So it generates electricity on both strokes. Now, one of the things that, that should be obvious to us because we live in a high tide area is this isn't going to work in Southern California, or it isn't going to work in Northern California, even even worse there, uh, because when the, when the tide height, the tide range begins to approach the wave height, then you can see that either you're going to have waves running over the top of this thing at high tide, or at low tide, it's going to be sitting there high and dry doing absolutely nothing. So, so here, to use this, you want to find a place that has a low tide range and really big waves. And there is such a place, the Hebrides Islands, in the, in the North Sea, and a lot of these are there. Uh, the, this is made, designed and made by a British company, and, and there are several of these in, in operation in Scotland. And I, I just want to give you some idea here. This is another uh, British device. It looks a little bit like a string of sausages. And there's a, these uh, long cylinders are joined by uh, a universal joint such that they can bend sideways and up and down and follow the contour, the surface contour of the ocean pretty well, uh, regardless of how it's changing or how fast it's changing. And when bending occurs between them, as shown here, then either you're, you are squeezing a hydraulic cylinder or extending a hydraulic cylinder, and that the hydraulic fluid goes through a hydraulic motor and drives the generator, and so in the end of each one of these units is, is a power generating device. And this is a picture of that full-scale device in just a moderate seaway, and 
Uh, it's very easy to see the flexing in the vertical direction. You have to look pretty closely to see the flexing in the horizontal direction, which is caused by the directionality of waves. And if this makes you seasick, look someplace else. <laughs> now, these have, have been in operation in, in Portugal for several years. Uh, that uh, farm is, is scheduled to be expanded considerably. And it is delivering useful amounts of electricity to villages and, and small cities along the Portuguese coast, which has very high waves, much like ours. And this is one of those strings on the launching waves, way about to be taken out to sea. Now, uh, this device, which has a very strange name, I don't know where that came from, but between these two horns on either side, and that's several hundred meters across, uh, the waves are concentrated. So it steers waves in towards the center until they get very big right there, and that allows them to run up this ramp and into a reservoir, which is maintained several feet above the, the uh, ordinary sea level. And when that excess water runs out the bottom, it goes through a turbine and it generates electricity. Now, this does look, I, I've got to admit, it does look like kind of a, a screwball scheme, however, for the last five years, it's been delivering electricity to the shore in Denmark. Those cans that you see there are the turbines and the, and the generators. This one is, a, is the, the last of, of our four types, and it's a heaving buoy. And it was tested off the Oregon coast, which is where we have the biggest waves in the United States. And some of you may wonder why, if this is a wave power device, why does it have those solar panels on there and those little windmills? Well, this was an experiment, and they were put on there just to supply the, the additional circuitry or power the additional circuitry uh, for instrumentation and for communications. And, and they're, they're not on the, on the working models. The technology is the aqua buoy wave energy converter. Inside each aqua buoy, two stroke hose pumps convert the vertical component of wave kinetic energy into pressurized seawater. Pressurized seawater is then directed into a conversion system consisting of a Pelton turbine driving an electrical generator. Aqua buoy clusters, or wave parks, are moored several kilometers offshore where wave power is greatest. Each wave park is scalable from hundreds of kilowatts to hundreds of megawatts. The electricity from each aqua buoy travels to a central point in the wave park and then to shore. Now, I just wanted to show a few cuts of how this thing is installed. It's, it's pretty big. As you can see, it's being towed out by this, by this towboat. And when those black airbags are disconnected from it, it will rotate into the vertical position. But notice the heaving. There's, the waves are really quite small, but it has very extensive response. Now, Pacific Gas and Electric has led a contract to this company to install a small farm initially uh, four years from now at, in the northern part of, of our state, offshore from Eureka with the intent that it would eventually be expanded uh, to uh, 100 megawatts, which is enough to meet the uh, electricity demands of a small city. And so this will probably be the forerunner. This will be the first such inst installation in the United States. So, but let's look at some of the problems that that, that wave farm or any other wave farm in the United States is going to face. So you want to go to Oregon and, wa and Washington, that's where the really big waves are, even bigger than, than in Northern California. But if you go where the resource is large, one thing you can count on is that every once in a while you're going to have a very, very big wave. So imagine a seven-story building 
and a wave that high crashing on you. Uh, the, the, the maintenance and repair and the cost of keeping equipment out there is going to be very, very high. Now, you remember this picture. Uh, this is how you put it out there. It's also how you remove it in case you've got to fix it. Now, how are you going to go in in the middle of this farm and do that without smashing three or four others around you as the waves push you around? So I, I see this as a, a very, very serious problem. It's something that the, the oil companies have faced in the Gulf, and, and they look at this and just roll their eyes. What if the anchor breaks and one of these big things comes up on the shore and, say, wipes out a marina? The, the liability is, is large. You want to go to Oregon and Washington in spite of those big waves because you're tough. But they've also got those big dams and all that hydroelectric power. As a matter of fact, they've got so much of it that they sell it to other states. And it's the cheapest electricity produced in the whole of the United States. Now, that's a tough place to sell wave power, a really tough place. None of the environmental lobbies, not even the Surfrider Foundation, has taken a, a look at this or come out with a, with a judgment on these large wave farms. But you can be assured that they will, and there will be serious problems, as there are with wind in the ocean, uh, with getting permits to do this. So let's look at the problems of the, of the customer. Let's look at the company that buys your electricity. Think what they're up against. This is a, a curve from this area on a summer day. And you can see that this is a curve of demand changing over 24 hours, more than twice as much at some time of the day at noon than it is at midnight. So the supplier of electricity has got to deal with that. But they have to deal with a much more serious problem. That is second by second. There's little tiny variations that don't even show on that curve in the demand. And, and the supply and the demand have to be exactly matched at all times. It sounds impossible, but that's exactly what happens. And, and so this, since the, they don't really like to be throttling up and down these huge power plants, then they are willing to pay a huge premium for anybody who can give me power right now and turn it off when I say so. So th this suggests the idea of storing energy. And since we can't control the waves and we can't even predict them very well, uh, then uh, it's important that we find some way to store it. And there have been several schemes that have been proposed to, to store wave energy. And, and all of this, of course, could apply to wind energy in the ocean, too. But for either economic or economic economics, for environmental or economical reasons, uh, none of these have ended up looking like real possibilities. But there is one way that has been tested on two continents for decades, which is a storage of compressed air. Now, on land, it's done in, in abandoned salt mines or salt domes. But it is proposed to, to be used to store energy and level out the output of the huge wind farms that are just now being planned for the Texas Panhandle area. They are going to go to this compressed air storage uh, approach, K's. And there, I'll show you some reasons why it might be even better if you did this in the ocean. So let's just take a minute and see how this thing works. This is a drawing of an actual mechanism that exists in Alabama. It's been in running for 30, 40 years. Uh, and when in the in the nighttime, when you've got excess capacity, you run this big guy in the middle as a motor. And then it 
turns these compressors and compresses air and shoves it down into the, to the salt dome. So during the daytime when you're starting to fall behind the demand curve, then you bring the air back in on this side, run it through the turbine, and now you run this big guy as a generator and level out your load. And, and you have very, very easy control of that. So what will we do in the ocean? Because we're not likely to find a salt dome exactly where we'd like to be. So in the ocean, you, you sink a container, a very, very large container, to the bottom of the ocean, and you deliberately put it at a spot where the pressure from the water above it results in exactly the pressure you'd like to have to optimally run your turbine. And then you, when the waves are big, you pump compressed air into this. By the way, it's, it's ballasted with lots of rocks so it doesn't float when it's full of air. Uh, and and you, you fill it with compressed air at this ideal pressure, probably something like 15 atmospheres. And then when you need to, to produce, you bring that air back in, through a system much like this and deliver it on, on demand whenever it's needed. And the advantage here is that when you have this system on land, as soon as you start to take some air out of this container, the pressure starts to drop. It's like letting air out of the balloon. Uh, whereas in the ocean, if you let seawater come in and replace the air, then the pressure remains constant. And so you're running the turbines at a constant pressure, which greatly increases their efficiency. So that the overall efficiency of the process, where you have to dump from one type of energy and, and turn it back into, into that again, uh, is accomplished at, at a much higher efficiency. And this is just a little diagram that, that shows the, the flipping back and forth between which mode you operate in. Now, as we come to the, to the end of this talk, I'd like to make a few comments about where I think all this is and where it's going. I think that this situation is going to be with us always. That is, we are going to be dependent upon technology from outside this country, mostly from, from Europe. Uh, although the Pacific Gas and Electric uh, Wave Farm that is proposed for your offshore of Eureka, uh, they, they do intend to actually build those buoys in the United States, but to a design that was developed and produced elsewhere, largely because there were governments that felt that this was important. And the lack of any government support for this has resulted in the, the lack of any uh, major U.S. industry, even a minor U.S. industry in this, in this field. I, I, already talked about, and I can't overemphasize, the, the cost that I see accumulating to maintain these in a very harsh environment. And this opinion comes from my experience over the years with maintaining facilities in the ocean that are subjected to very big waves. It's obvious that the promoters don't agree with me. And in fact, I hope I'm wrong. But at this point, I, I have to close with this projection. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Whatever happened to OTEC? Uh, OTEC almost made it uh, in the 80s in Hawaii. Uh, they, they had taken bids, they were ready to go. Uh, two things happened. They, they had a, um, a hurricane, unusual, came through their typhoon that came through there, and they, they had a big landslide 
exactly at the place where they're going to run the cold water pipe. And then also about that time, uh, the oil scare died down. The price of oil dropped dramatically. And so uh, OTEC, which is, by the way, is ocean thermal energy. It's taking the difference between warm water and the surface and really cold water from down deep and, and having a very, very low efficiency boiler. And, and it's a steam plant. And uh, it's very expensive. And, and it's got to be big. It has to be huge to make any sense at all. And it only works where you have lots of warm water and you're very close to cold water. So the Gulf of Mexico, lots of warm water, long, long way to cold water because of the, of the broad shelf. So probably only in Florida and in Hawaii would, that, would OTEC make any sense in the United States. Why would you want to do this? Uh, some of it is because it's there. Uh, OK. Now, the, the state of California, for, for example, has told the power companies, you're going to have X percent of your output is going to be green. It's not going to be gas or, or oil. So, so you look around and you say, what's out there? Uh, you know, I, I, if I was Pacific Gas and Electric, I would say, I don't really care what it costs. Um, so, but obviously, that's not the case in Europe. And then they, they don't have that, that same argument. And they're making it work there. So uh, I would say that, that uh, over the years, this will probably become quite competitive uh, because it's green and because you're, you don't have a carbon tax on it. I mean, you're going to be competing against a different set of rules uh, than you are today. So uh, it, it is more expensive. There's no question. It, there, there, is, there is no way that you can take energy from, from the ocean today by any means. And I'm talking about th thermal and, and uh, windmills offshore where the wind is very strong. Good, good place to, to put windmills. Uh, all of the possible ways of doing this, there's no way to do that and compete with the cheapest electricity in a coal-fired plant. Well, yeah, there, 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 will, be, there will be competition. But uh, for example, in, in, uh, off the West Coast, to get out far enough to get the really strong winds, which is what you like, the water is very, very deep. So it's very expensive to have a floating platform anchored out there in that very deep water. So wind is not going to, offshore wind is not going to look very good in the Pacific. Waves is a different story. You can, get, you can get deep water fairly close to land, which means you have very short extension cords, very short transmission lines, and that reduces the cost. So in different parts of the country, uh, different kinds of ocean renewable will be more attractive, more competitive. But it's not going to compete with coal. How soon could the U.S. be completely reliant on, on green energy? It's a large number. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it depends upon on your uh, definition of green. I think that, that it would be impossible for the U.S. to be energy independent, that is, independent of gas and oil and coal without nuclear. So nuclear is the only possible way that we're going to do that. Now, if you, you can classify it as green or not, depending upon your viewpoint. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't, doesn't mess with the environment the way that, that the fossil fuels do. Uh, but I would say that, that for ocean energy to make a significant contribution, a really significant contribution, is probably on order of 10 years from now. And it, and it would require a change in the attitude of the American people. Uh, we had a very, very well-planned, well-financed offshore wind farm planned for near Cape Cod, and it got axed politically. So 
we, we have to change our attitude about this a little bit before we're, we're even going to start to make progress in that. What, the, the question is, what are the relative costs uh, of, of a whole string of, of uh, possibilities, which I'm really not, I'm really not prepared to do that on, on hard numbers. The costs vary substantially depending upon where you are and what you're, what you're using, and certainly depend upon who you're competing with. Uh, offshore wind looks very good in the British Isles. In, in the north, off, off Scotland. Uh, offshore wind in England doesn't look very good. It's not, it's not competitive. So that I'm, I mention that just as indicating the difficulty in, in trying to assess the economics, the relative economics. Uh, the Germans have taken a very interesting turn. Uh, they're the biggest user of offshore wind uh, in the world. But they're taking a strong second look at this now and they say, well, this is pretty expensive technology. Uh, it's green, but it's pretty expensive. So why, what would happen if we just took that same amount of money and started retrofitting our existing buildings so they used less electricity? So they're kind of saying, whoa, well, you know, we're, we're, we rushed into this thing, but, but we're not so sure that that's the right thing to do. So there are these, these non, uh, non-economic in the sense of not, not trying to say, well, you make it for 12, 12 cents a unit and, uh, and I have to get 15 cents a unit, so therefore I can't compete. Uh, but let me point out that storage capability is tremendously important. If, if you have, I mean, wave energy is considered to be dirt energy by, by the companies that, that buy it. It's, they will pay you about five cents a unit for wave or wind energy, which can't be controlled. If you can control it, they'll pay you 15 cents a unit. Now, three times as much starts to make things look quite economical. Doesn't mean that, that, that uh, wave power is cheap. It isn't, and it probably never will be very cheap. But if, if we're successful in finding a way to make it controllable, then it would, it would change the economics absolutely. I, I know I didn't answer your question, and I can't. I'm sorry. 